Hi, this is Colin. This is our annual horror movie show. You know, we do this every year, and it's also a little bit of a struggle for me because I don't watch that many horror movies, and I, I haven't mastered the canon. But I'm kind of horror curious these days, and I'm, I think, a little bit more open to watching movies that are supposedly scary, and I'm much less likely to be afraid of them, too. I think it is a thing you shouldn't make your mind up about. So today on the show, we're going to talk about an independent studio that has basically become kind of a brand of horror movie that people know about. They know enough to go see the next one by this studio. We'll also talk about the 40th anniversary of Poltergeist and what that movie was maybe really all about. And we'll also talk about the delicate relationship between women audiences and horror movies. Women like horror more than you think. Hello and welcome every year. Every year I forget that we do an annual horror show right around Halloween. Every year producer Jonathan McPants reminds me of that and tells me that we're going to be doing it again. And so we're doing it again. And I have to confess that I don't watch a lot of horror. Although, I don't know, for last week's nose, I watched the movie Athena, which is not a horror movie, but I guarantee you is more harrowing than three out of five actual horror movies that I might watch. So we're going to talk about horror movies from lots of different angles here. And we're going to begin in a way that we never have before by talking about a studio that has increasingly placed its stamp on the horror genre. This is an independent studio. Here to talk to us about that is Nate Jones, staff writer for New York Magazine. And just to kind of give you a sense, the horror movies this year that have really been a big part of the conversation among people who like the genre or just kind of even approach the genre with mixed feelings would probably include Bodies, 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 Men, Pearl, and X. Those are all from one studio. It's called A24. Nate knows from a user's point of view about as much about A24 as is possible for a user to know. So maybe you can get the conversation started. Tell people just how deeply immersed you decided to become in the output of A24. I am incredibly deeply immersed. I am you know, up to my eyebrows in it. Probably the first week of the pandemic, I was looking for things to do. I am a movies writer by trade and no movies were coming out. So I was looking for a sort of big, long project. And I sort of hit on the idea of watching and ranking all every A24 film. At the time, there was probably around 90 something. There are now roughly 115, maybe 120. I sort of went through it in fits and starts. And this summer, I was probably 80% done. And my editor told me, hey, let's actually finish this. And we pushed it out. And on August 24th, 824, we published it. Right. We see what you did there. And in your top 10 were number one was Hereditary. Number seven was Under the Skin. Number nine was The Witch. Number 10 is Midsummer. All of those fit fairly comfortably into the horror genre. But maybe before we get to that part, explain what A24 is and, and why it, it would be different maybe from most, to the extent that anybody knows what, I don't know, Searchlight is or, or something. Why is A24 different from those kinds of brands? So yes, yeah, so A24 is an indie film studio. They started as a distributor, but then with the film Moonlight, actually, they started making their own films. This is not a joke. Moonlight has won Best Picture. Moonlight, Best Picture. They started around 10 years ago with a mandate to kind of give directors, I don't want to say total freedom, but sort of what people say is sort of unprecedented freedom. They sort of let directors make whatever films they want to make, and then they are very savvy about selling them. And in the process of getting very savvy about selling them, they've also gotten very savvy about selling themselves. Just, you know, an incredible, the brand is strong, as the kids say. And it sort of has given them kind of like the vibe of an old cool record label, where it's, you know, it's like there's this one record label that's putting out all the cool bands you like. A24 is sort of the film version of that, where it's like, oh, you, you notice there's all these cool art house films you like. And then you notice, oh, like there's this one studio with this cool logo that is putting them all out. And horror has been, you know, horror has been a part of them since the beginning. It's been a huge part of their brand. You know, it's kind of easy to see why. Like horror, it's, you can make it with a low budget. It's usually a solid bet box office wise. There's sort of a core audience of horror people. 
And then also, you know, in recent years, you've also been increasingly able to sell it to the art house crowd with with the sort of label of elevated horror, which, you know, a lot of people really dislike. But if you are a marketer, it is a very useful term. Right. We should talk about we should talk about that term. So elevated horror implicitly means maybe a little bit more complicated, more psychologically oriented, maybe somehow or other based on real world socioeconomic anxieties. And so, I mean, an A24 movie like It Comes at Night, where they're, they're really, you know, a lot of this is just sort of waiting. There's a lot of just anticipatory dread as opposed to sinks regurgitating blood. I assume that's kind of a big part of what elevated horror would be. Yes, I think anticipatory dread is sort of, if you had to sum up the A24 horror aesthetic in two words, that is pretty much, you nailed it. You know, they're very metaphorical. There's often, you know, the joke is that they're all secretly about trauma. There's sort of the promise to the viewer that there's maybe a little more going on artistically than sort of, you know, a cheapo slasher film. Right. I would also say that it's been a while, I think, since there was a studio name that really was sort of bandied about in in regular conversation outside the world of film nerds. Although I would point out that during the 1980s and early 1990s, there was a company called Orion, and they did all the Woody Allen movies, but they also did Terminator and RoboCop and This Is Spinal Tap, and they had a whole bunch of Best Picture Award winners, Amadeus, Platoon, Dances with Wolves, Silence of the Lambs. So when that Orion thing popped up on the screen and there's a little picture of the constellation anything and the light spinning around it really meant something to people all right this is there's probably a floor below which this movie is unlikely to fall even though they did throw mama from the train and that's something else is something like that's going on with a24 right i mean people if you know you know and so you might talk to somebody else about this being an a24 movie but i do have a sense of for a how prevalent that is and and b what it amounts to do, do people actually say let's go see this movie it's it's an a24 film yeah i mean i think that i think you are spot on with the orion comparison yeah we've had sort of these equivalents before the thing that a24 has done is sort of put this sort of 21st century digital spin on it where they are you know, very into memes. And there, there's sort of this sort of online community of A24 fans in a way that maybe you wouldn't have had like Miramax fans in the 90s or something like that. And they are very good at sort of cultivating this fandom, you know, in a way that it, that is, yeah, it's very online. It's it's very social media driven. It's It's very savvy. I kind of want to go from there since you're talking about yeah. online. So one of the things that they kind of figured out, first of all, is, yep, there are like influencers on social media. There are, And there are ways in which it's worth trying to create some kind of online phenomena and maybe even build – a moment into a movie that might be memeable. I mean, it isn't exactly a horror movie, but it isn't exactly not a horror movie. But for example, in the movie Ex Machina, there's this kind of weird little moment where Oscar Isaac is kind of doing this little dance. I told you, you're wasting your time talking to her. However, you would not be wasting your time if you were dancing with her. And a fiendish intellect could think, wow, they just did that so that it could get turned into like a GIF or something. Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, if you see a movie, and also not a horror movie, but a movie like Uncut Gems is one I think is sort of a quintessential A24 film where it's not, even if there's not moments that, you know, were designed to be memes, you can tell, you know, somebody described it to me as very like hooky. Like every sort of five minutes, there's like another viral hook that you could see being pulled out and being turned into like this whole other context. You know, you can you can see it being a meme or being a gif or something like that or being, you know, a quote that people say on film Twitter and stuff. It seems to me another thing that A24 has figured out, and you've already kind of alluded to this, is the sense that nobody's really in just one business anymore. You know, it might have made sense 20, 30, 40 years ago for a company to think, well, we make movies and that's it. We'll just make movies and hopefully people will watch them. It seems as though A24 understands it's like in a lot of different businesses. And one of those businesses is the merchandise business. And sometimes the merchandise is exclusively for promotional purposes. And maybe at other times it's stuff that you, they really kind of hope people will just buy for its own sake. But can you give us some examples of the creative ways they're using all that? Of course. They have sort of two different lanes. The first lane is kind of like things 
from the movie that the, the, they then sort of turn into a real thing. So like one good example, there's this movie they did called First Reformed, which is this very austere drama about this church in upstate New York. And in one scene of this movie, they go to the church's gift shop, which is kind of funny because, you know, it's this very harsh, severe film. And then it's, it's kind of funny that it has a scene set in a gift shop. There's sort of this incongruity to it. And so they decided to promote this film by selling like the actual merchandise that you see in the gift shop. So it's, you know, it's a sort of like two or three levels deep of irony that they have. They also, you know, they released this film this year called Everything Everywhere All at Once, which was a huge hit. But, you know, a lot of it takes place in a tax office and the, the tax professional played by Jamie Lee Curtis has these sort of auditor of the month club trophies that just happen to look exactly like butt plugs. And A24 thought, well, that's fun. You know, why don't we sell candles that just so happen to look like these trophies that just so happen to look like butt plugs? But then the second lane is sort of more like hype beastie. They'll find these like very hip labels, you know, these sort of underground New York clothing labels, and they will partner with them for these sort of limited edition like merch drops. So there's this company called Online Ceramics that makes a lot of sort of like deadhead style t-shirts and stuff. And they partnered with them for Hereditary. But they, you know, do these sort of, they partner with these hip labels, they only do extremely limited editions of them. And then these become sort of like, you know, weird collector's items where you see them sort of, you know, circulating on the internet retail market, you know, with people being like, oh my God, you know, I spent 200 bucks on this t-shirt. Like what a great deal. <laughs> so yeah, so it's it's sort of a two-pronged approach. Right. I do want to say that as a, a big fan of the movie First Reformed, I bought the barbed wire shirt that they sell, you know, and I, it's not that comfortable, but uh, <laughs> but it makes me feel a lot closer to Ethan Hawke when I put it on. <laughs> we should say a little bit, Nate, about this year's crop of A24 horror movies. I mean, it's interesting. These are all sort of very different movies that kind of all fit into a few different sort of A24 lanes. So I think the, I think the one that you would say the, comes the closest to, you know, what we would think of as A24 horror is Men, which is, you know, you talk about dread and sort of heavy themes and weighty themes. Yes, yeah, so it's got, you know, Jesse Buckley and an isolated house in the countryside and every man she meets all has the same face. He was stalking me. What makes you say that? I saw him twice. You saw him twice? I don't know if he saw you once. It's not quite stalking, is it? He followed me out of the woods, then tried to break into the house. see him again give us a shout yeah the movie was like not amazingly received there was a lot of people who were like "Ooh, it's you know very heavy-handed in its themes it's sort of you know this very blunt force depiction of misogyny but i think you know in terms of fitting the bill for what you know a quote-unquote a24 horror movie is I, you know it sort of delivers that in spades and then bodies 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 i would say it is it is a horror movie but it's sort of you know a horror comedy satire in a weird way you know a24 has this other sort of sideline in just like youth baiting films you know they started with spring breakers they had zola a few years ago on tv you know they helped make euphoria it's these films that are sort of you know very neon very hedonistic very sort of like plugged into the discourse and bodies 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 you know fits that to a t it's got all these young actors who are sort of rising up and coming gen z actors jordan what are you doing i'm staying safe really because it looks like you're grabbing a fucking meat cleaver to go look for my boyfriend <laughs> Wow. Boyfriend? That's the first time I've heard you call him that. That's crazy. Don't be such a bitch. Alice, I'm literally just protecting myself, okay? Let me remind you, our friend is dead. The movie sort of, you know, stops in its place a few times to sort of just, like, read Twitter at you. It's just sort of like watching the characters have a Twitter fight. But it is also, you know, very, it has, you know, some things to say about the way people sort of position their brands online and the way these sort of social justice arguments get sort of deployed as this sort of shield and personal arguments. And it did have a lot of fans. And I think especially for young viewers, it seemed like it really sort of resonated with them. And it felt that this movie was sort of speaking their language. Yeah. And, um, and I think you're touching upon something that I, I sense is an aspect of, of A24, too, which is, I mean, just to go back to sort of wide release kinds of movies of the past. I mean, a lot of those wind up becoming just infused into the culture so that if you're watching, 
Kimmy Schmidt, and there's a joke where John Hamm is basically saying a version of the Hannibal Lecter speech in Silence <laughs> of the Lambs. You're here with your bad shoes and your good bag and all this kind of stuff. You laugh at that because everybody's seen Silence of the Lambs, and so you get it. It's transposed into a comic context. That's probably not going to happen so much with A24, but what you are going to do, I assume, Nate, is go out for coffee or wine or something with your friends after seeing the movie or get together with some people, either online or in person, and talk about it, right? These movies don't just stay up on the screen. They have to get out into our lives afterwards. Yes, exactly. That's also a thing that a lot of the fans spoke about is like, there is sort of a community in the discussion. Like, yes, the references they create are not mass mainstream references, but that enough people have seen them that, yeah, you can sort of be sure that, you know, everyone hasn't seen them, but my people have seen them. And, you know, this is sort of how I can find my people. All right. So we've been talking to Nate Jones, the staff writer for New York Magazine. We'll take a little break. We'll come back. I'm a hot girl, pop girl, rich girl. I'm a bitch girl, false girl. Catch me if you can, girl. You a swerve girl. Who the fuck are you, girl? You just want to be me. I'm a hot girl, pop girl, rich girl. I'm a bitch girl, false girl. Catch me if you can, girl. You a swerve girl. If you listen to this episode every year, you probably have divined that I am not really a horror fan. And one reason I'm not a horror fan, I think, is because for most of my life, I've had a lot of anxieties. I have fewer anxieties now that most of the things that I was ever anxious about have actually happened. I I find I'm less anxious and I can enjoy horror now. But I always also assume that, and I think a lot of people assume, that women are not horror fans. So let's delve into this a little bit. Lindsay Lee Wallace is a writer and horror enthusiast. She wrote Why Women Watch Horror for Blood Knife, one of our favorite publications, back in 2021. And she joins us now. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So first of all, we should say that some of the horror movies, some of the horror movies that are kind of in the conversation this year, either use female protagonists or female antagonists. I'm thinking Barbarian, Bodies, 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 Men, Pearl, Smile, X. So if you were to judge from that end of things, you might reasonably conclude that the people who make movies think that women want to see movies that feature women prominently and as something other than helpless victims. Well, I actually, one of the things that I think is interesting about it is that women have always featured really prominently in horror, more so than a lot of other genres. If you look at, there's research into, you know, who gets the most lines in different genres of film and horror is second only to romance in terms of women getting screen time and getting to speak on screen. So I totally agree that there are a ton of movies this year in the genre that are, you know, female antagonists and protagonists. But I also think that that's very much in line with the legacy of horror in general. Right. There's this person named Jamie Lee Curtis. (laughs) (laughs) I have heard of her. Who's having quite a year this year, generally speaking, but has also had, you know, dating back to 1978 or something, quite a career, not just in one particular franchise of horror, but kind of lots of other horror movies as well. And and for the most part, she does not play a helpless victim. That that might have been a clue right away that there's something going on. The Myers house. You're not supposed to go up there. Yes, I am. Just watch. Lonnie Edelson gets a haunted house. He said awful stuff happened there once. Lonnie Lamb probably won't get out of the sixth grade. Speaking to what you were saying earlier about anxiety and its relationship to your ability to watch horror, I know that for a lot of people, myself included, horror is sort of an outlet for existing anxiety. It's an opportunity to experience, you know, fear that might plague you in everyday life, but in a more controlled setting. And I think that for Jamie Lee Curtis as like the the proto final girl in the Halloween franchise and, you know, all the way up to the present day with some of the movies that we were talking about earlier, like Barbarian, there's an opportunity through this genre to have an accelerated and more satisfyingly concluded version of that anxiety. And that's really powerful for me as a woman and for lots of minorities who exist with a level of anxiety, depression, other mental health symptoms that comes at you from society that doesn't normally have a satisfying conclusion. It's really powerful to get that conclusion through a horror movie. For what it's worth, Jamie Lee Curtis says she doesn't like horror movies. She doesn't like anything that's (laughs) kind of upsetting or anything like that. But so one of the things you looked at for your article was there's been some research about it. But I don't know, when you kind of look at the crosstabs, as they say, it doesn't really look like research that would impress, let's say, Nate Silver. (laughs) And I I do always aim to impress Nate Silver. We're all Um, all about just, just trying to impress Nate somehow, anything with everything we do. Of course. Yeah, I think on the one hand, if you look at the study that the the snuggle theory came out of, which is the idea that 
you know, if you put a straight couple together watching horror, the man enjoys it because it makes the woman scared and he gets to comfort her and the woman enjoys it because she gets to be comforted. So the whole idea is that horror is good because it's replicating and reinforcing these entrenched gender roles. But if you look at, you know, the whole setup for that study, it was never going to yield anything else because they recruited from this, you know, very specific environment of like 20s, mostly white, mostly straight, supposedly college students. And they created, you know, conditions to get what they wanted out of the research, which I think is true from a lot of this research that it's sort of like, it is not surprising that when you go into something with a certain bias, your research is going to be designed to give you a certain kind of answer. Right. And I, I can tell you that I'm certainly a statistical outlier here because like I'm <laughs> I'm the person who's watching through my fingers and making little tiny little baby chick noises uh, <laughs> of, of fear. I'm not actually particularly useful as a comforter of a scared woman or anybody else for that matter. So, so if in fact that research is not impressive – and probably doesn't even mirror very well what we're seeing out there in real life. Maybe you could say a little bit more about what does seem to be happening. What's you, You've already kind of alluded to some aspects of it. What, what's the dynamic now that brings women to watch horror? They're, they're not there with some big strong man comforting them. They're doing something else. Yeah, I mean, I think that for myself and all of my friends that I watch horror with, we all tend to be like a pretty anxious group of people. We all tend to be a group of people that, you know, a lot of us are queer. And the idea that we are enjoying horror to reinforce like societal gender roles is pretty out the window the moment that we turn it on. So it's more a matter, I think, of getting to see, you know, something scary happening, something scary that brings up similar feelings that you maybe have every day in your life where you don't have control over those feelings and getting to experience that in more of a controlled setting. And I also think that horror is showing us our our societal anxieties, like churning them out at a rate that's like really rapid. If you look at, you know, the speed with which we got horror that was focused on the pandemic, you know, we're still in the pandemic. We had that within the first year. So if you are a person who is a locus for society's anxieties, if you're a member of a marginalized group, then you can watch a horror movie and see sort of like what you're afraid of every day that often is subtext, made text, and then you can sometimes you can see yourself as the protagonist overcome that or you can read into it even if it's not what is explicit there's like a coded reading that allows you to sort of feel that you're overcoming that constant drumbeat of anxiety that you usually don't have any control over and it's also sort of an opportunity for community between marginalized people like between women watching horror i know that the i recently listened to your episode about true crime and the true crime genre is pretty fairly maligned in a lot of ways but one of the things that makes it interesting is how many women especially straight white women who maybe are looking for a locus for anxiety that is being fed to them not totally accurately with what the real danger facing them in society is but how many flock to a genre that makes them feel in control makes them feel like their fears are seen and that there's something they can do about them. And I think that that is sort of similar for a lot of people with horror. Right. So one of the other films that you mentioned in your article is Promising Young Woman. To me, watching Promising Young Woman, I thought, oh, this is like a Jordan Peele movie. It's about a problem <laughs> that's real. The problem itself is real. The treatment of the problem is kind of fantastical. And it feels like that's increasingly maybe going to be a genre, the, the, the sort of the Jordan Peele type, promising young woman type movie is a new expression of horror. Or maybe you would say it's not a new expression of horror. Yeah. I mean, I think that what you're getting at is that there's horror coming out now that has been referred to derisively by some as like, oh, horror's gotten woke, which I think is... Horrors always had people in it that maybe you didn't want to pay attention to. I would say to people who would make that claim that, you know, if you just want to believe that only now horror is beginning to comment on racism or beginning to comment on rape culture, then you haven't been paying attention. But I do think that in movies like, you know, Jordan Peele's Get Out and Promising Young Woman, that commentary has become a lot more explicit, or at least it is a lot more resonant with the way that we talk about it now. It's not so, you know, spun up into movie language or whatever. And it's definitely interesting to see because you can you can see, you know, here are the the divisiveness of a movie like Promising Young Woman, which is the story of a woman who, after having been assaulted, she goes on sort of a mission to prevent assaults, sexual assaults from happening in the future by pretending to be inebriated and then ending up in situations where she can sort of scare the shit out of some threatening men. I am a nice guy. You keep saying that. You're not as rare as you think. You know how I know? No. 
because every week I go to a club and every week I act like I'm too drunk to stand and every fucking week a nice guy like you comes over to see if I'm okay. That's a movie that a lot of people have really divided feelings about because everyone deals with having had an experience like that. Everyone who is a survivor of an assault has a different way that they have processed that. And that movie is, you know, some people think it's like incredibly victorious to watch. Some people think the ending is really disturbing. And some people think that it's not an accurate representation of the problem. But that's one of the things about stories is that they're never going to be a perfect encapsulation of a social issue, nor should they try to be. And I think that's one of the, when people say, oh, horror has gotten woke, those people are usually not speaking in good faith. And there's a lot of pretty bigoted feelings that come out as soon as somebody gets an opportunity to say something like that. Right. That raises a really interesting question, which is, you know, how do you watch certain movies? Because I think Promising Young Woman is a movie, you have to watch it a certain way. You know, but there's some movies... I don't know. Like I think about a movie like Bird Box. I'd hate to watch Bird Box <laughs> trying to figure out what the social <laughs> message of it is. It might be an allegory about being blindfolded and having to get through life or something. But I mean, some of these movies, maybe they just need to be watched by women or by everybody for just the satisfaction of watching them. I mean, yeah, I think that that's like as soon as you start prescribing people to watch a certain film, especially a horror film as a way of understanding an issue, I feel like you're sort of missing what is powerful about media as a way of helping people understand the world or helping people get a new perspective on an issue because it's it's not a matter of like i'm going to sit you down and tell you exactly what you need to think about xyz it's a matter of like i'm going to present to you a scenario in which you're going to empathize with somebody you might not ordinarily empathize with or you're going to see things from a perspective that you don't have in your own life in your own social circle and i think that the pitfall of like thinking that all you need to do to make a successful horror movie about an issue is to point at it that you can see in the queer slasher they slash them which takes place at a conversion camp it ends up just being so tied into knots about the the moralism of the issue that it's pointing at that in addition to just frankly not being a very good movie it fails to create a compelling narrative aside from just we want to tell you that conversion therapy is bad and conversion therapy is horrible it deserved a better movie to make that point than this one that wasn't interested in telling a story. It was interested in sitting you down and saying conversion therapy is horrible. Also, here's Kevin Bacon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the risk, right? But it sort of raises the question, particularly, yeah, I mean, in your piece, you get into the whole issue of queer people, trans people as horror audiences. And there's clearly a constituency there and a market there, although you'd hate to have companies green lighting stuff just saying, oh, well, let's go after that target. We we haven't really mined that particular vein of gold out there in audience <laughs> land. So let's go, let's go do another one of those kinds of movies. I definitely think that there is a, all I can do is speculate. I certainly am not in these rooms. I don't know these executives. Um, and I want them to know that I will, I will continue to watch queer horror, but I would love for them to understand that they also need to prioritize making it good. And I do think that there's an incentive to a certain degree to uplift or to green light and push through maybe less challenging or less refined works by minority artists because you don't want to create a paradigm where you need to genuinely shift what you're making. You need to start like consistently changing the, you know, how often you make queer movies in your production studio or whatever, it's easier to just be like, you know, three times a year, we're going to cash in on this audience with something that is not going to challenge the status quo and make us have to reshuffle our whole approach. We're going to make sure that we're not uplifting too many things that are genuinely challenging. That's my pet conspiracy theory, though. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other things you do explore in there is the experience that trans people have watching horror movies, and then it may have kind of a special message to them. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so when I wrote this piece, I spoke to film critic Emily St. James, and she talked a lot about her experience watching horror and relating to the role that trans people undertake to sort of like create themselves and to do so in a society that is completely unwelcoming to that, especially increasingly today. And I think for a lot of trans people, like, Body horror is something that if you are a person who has been made to experience a puberty that is the wrong puberty for you, that's something that you can very much relate to is watching your body become not your own. And that horror is a genre where whether it's 
to cast it as villainous or just because it's coded under the radar with, you know, a gay director like James Whale making Bride of Frankenstein, that it's a genre where you see gender being transgressed and you see people acting in ways and looking in ways that are not along with the norm of this is what it is to be a woman or what it is to be a man. So there's always going to be a home for queer people in a genre where it's not so immediate that people would behave in a certain way. Representation is incredibly meaningful and having a character be explicitly queer, explicitly trans. I mean, you can see how important it is anecdotally and in research. At the same time, like that character has to have an identity that is meaningful and be a full character and not just be, you know, wearing a name tag that says, hi, I'm gay, give me $20. Like it's, <laughs> you're always going to be able to relate to people in that genre, but partly it's because their cast is outsiders. And when something becomes profitable, the outsider aspect of it sort of starts to ring a little hollow, I think. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how you can see the name tag I'm wearing when the Zoom video is off. But um <laughs> The, Jonathan um, told me about it before. Okay. He would. So yeah, I guess that maybe this might have to be my last question because we're kind of running out of time here. But yeah, you don't want it to be too on the nose. And in a way, what I took away from your article and what I'm taking away from this conversation too is your relation. one's relationship to horror changes, I think, if you already feel as though you're in kind of a horror story, you know, probably somebody like me, I'm a white male. I enjoy a lot of advantages from that. I'm a straight white male. I enjoy even more advantages, you know, in, and I'm just trying to avoid becoming anxious. But but as you're as you're talking, I'm realizing, well, for a lot of people who are already basically facing you know, a, a lot of menaces that I don't face on a daily basis, your relationship with horror would be a lot different. It would be, oh, yeah, I know that feeling. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. And I mean, I do think that we're all, especially these past few years, like we're existing in a state of really heightened anxiety. There's climate anxiety, there's pandemic anxiety, there's the government crumbling. Like it's everyone deserves an outlet for their anxiety, even if horror isn't the right one. But I know like personally, I'm like a very fearful person and I couldn't watch horror movies for a long time. And I can still remember when I was like 12 or 13, it was like a switch flip and I was still fucking terrified, but I was also experiencing that terror as a kind of catharsis because it was the one outlet where I knew that there was going to be a narrative ending to whatever was scaring me as opposed to real life where it just, you know, kind of goes on and on. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I think that it's it's an opportunity to show people different kinds of narratives. And then for people who relate to it, it's an opportunity to experience a catharsis. And in terms of, you know, should these movies be explicit in their portrayal of different types of people? Should they be, should they take on issues really, really upfront? Or should there be more subtext? Like if we had more of them, we wouldn't have to ask questions like that. So maybe there should just be a wild abundance of queer horror. And, and then we could just, you know, all enjoy what we needed and take from it what we were looking for. Well, we're going to have to stop there. But Lindsay Lee Wallace, you're a lot of fun to talk to. I hope this is not your final appearance on this show by any means. Lindsay Lee Wallace is a writer and horror enthusiast. She wrote Why Women Watch Horror for Blood Knife. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I, I hope that I'm back again, too. All right. Let's take a little break and then we'll come back. So a few people to thank. Actually, a lot of people to thank. We have three different technical producers for this particular episode. I think that might be a record. Gene Amatruda, Kat Pasture, and Dylan Reyes all at various times were uh, running the control board uh, in there. The episode itself is produced by Jonathan McPants, who not only produced it, but is in charge of reminding me every year that we have this tradition of doing this particular type of horror show and keying in on the 40th anniversary of something. And another record is being set because our next guest is, I think, making a repeat appearance on one of these shows. He was with us for a conversation we had about The Fly. Jacob Trussell is a writer and the author of a forthcoming book about Poltergeist from Die, Die Books. I guess I just sort of buried the lead there. We're going to be talking about the movie Poltergeist. They're here. So, Jacob, maybe begin by just talking about why this is something to write a book about. What makes Poltergeist maybe different or more of a landmark or sea change than a lot of other movies of its type? 
Yeah. So the reason why I kind of chose Poltergeist when I was originally contracted by Die Die Books to write this is essentially because it's such a large part of my childhood. It was definitely one of the first uh, horror movies I remember watching. And I would actually go so far as to say it's potentially one of the first horror movies many people watched. And I think that has to do with the fact that Steven Spielberg was the producer on there. So it came with this sort of idea that it would be a family friendly adventure, which frankly it is. It is a haunted house story really unlike anything that had ever come out before. And I think that that's one of the reasons why Poltergeist has continued to have such a lasting impact on the horror genre and also ghost stories and haunted house movies in general, is that it really helped kind of recontextualize the the classic traditions of ghost stories that were really kicked off by the likes of uh, Charles Dickens and M.R. James. But for a modern modern setting, we had never really seen a haunted house in the middle of a suburban situation before. And that's really what kind of made it so remarkable at the time, because now these haunted houses weren't just the obviously old and creepy houses you'll see uh, on a hill and with like uh, dark clouds roaming over it. This was a regular house that people that were watching in 1982 possibly lived in and might have might have looked quite a lot like their houses and that really kind of made the terror feel just a slight bit more real to them or at least less of a distance between it that they could keep because you know oh I don't live in a ancient victorian home I just live in a suburban house and that's where uh, so much of the horror comes out of right and so we should talk a little bit about this I was intrigued to find out through your book that Stephen King was actually approached about writing the script for this and didn't want to do it because the money was Right, but you know Stephen King uh, used to tell this story about seeing the Amityville Horror in a you know little movie theater in Belfast, Maine, or Augusta, or someplace. <laughs> and there's a, was a woman sitting in front of him, a middle aged, middle class woman sitting in front of him, who as he's watching the Amityville Horror, she's and there's like just blood pouring down the stairs and goo coming out of the walls or whatever, and she's just kind of rocking back and forth in, according to him, this kind of religious ecstasy, going, "Think of the bills, think of the bills," <laughs> and his point is. This is a movie about anxiety about houses. You know, it's sort of at a time when people, instead of buying a house to live in, were buying houses as investments that would appreciate and then they'd flip them and get something else, you know, and sort of like, what are we doing here? And I think Poltergeist is very much in that in that same train somehow. There's a sense here that what are these develops, developments that we're living in? They're not places that really existed in this form 100 years ago. You know, this isn't these aren't houses from 1912. <laughs> <laughs> These are houses that kind of came out of nowhere. And and I do think that horror very effectively does twang at things that we're kind of worried about at a very subliminal level. You know, we're not really sort of conscious of this. But to me, that's what I see in Poltergeist is, what the hell is this place where we live? We're starting phase five right here where we're standing. All of this can be your master bedroom suite. That can be your view. Interesting. Well, Mr. Teague, you know, that's a generous offer. This idea of getting stuck in an investment, you're sinking so much money into it that, you know, two weeks later, a month later, uh, years later, turns out to be an investment that's completely, you know, uninhabitable. And then they're stuck. And then we have this, you know, entire idea of following the American dream, especially in like the 70s and the 80s when this film is set, you know, was directing people to like having your own home and having that nine to five job and being able to sustain yourself. And I think the kind of ironic point that Poltergeist makes and that you could argue that a lot of haunted house movies like the Amityville horror makes is like what happens when your dream is built on a lie? What happens when your dream is a nightmare? And I think that that's something that Poltergeist does so well, and especially kind of contextualizing it around, for lack of a better term, the evils of capitalism. It's at the core of the whole reason why the, the haunting in the film is happening. We've already made arrangements for relocating the cemetery. Oh, you're kidding Oh, come on. I mean, that's sacrilegious, isn't it? Oh, don't worry about it. After all, it's not ancient tribal burial ground. It's just people. Right. And I think also there's a way in which this is a little bit of a Ronald Reagan era 
artifact. I mean, Reagan famously said, and I'll, I'll get the quote wrong, but he says something to the effect that the American dream is that anybody, anybody could make a million dollars. Anybody could become a millionaire. It's something along those lines, which is, I think, a transmogrification of the old American dream, which is yeah, you could... Like you used to be like Levittown or something was the American dream. You could own something, you know. You could you could own a dwelling place, which not everybody previously had. You could do a little bit better than your parents' generation, whatever that was, you know. And I think the Reagan era kind of enlarged aspirationally that idea. So suddenly, instead of that, you own this house that's kind of new and fancy looking and there's a lot of anxiety about like a new house too well and what happens when the drawers start opening and closing for no reason and damn it the chairs just slide right across the kitchen you know? <laughs> what the hell's wrong with this house i paid so much money for but there's something about that too right yeah i i think that ronald reagan is definitely a sort of figure in the background of poltergeist a lot of people take sort of the the impulse of that because there's a scene within poltergeist where the parents are sort of uh sitting around in their in their bedroom talking and, and smoking grass and things like that. But in Craig T. Nelson's hands is this book about Ronald Reagan. It was actually not even a biography. It was about the lead up to his presidential inauguration. And a lot of people look at that and say, oh, look, here is, you know, a kernel of what the themes or what they're they're trying to sort of contextualize and talk about. And like, as you said, like the American dream has shifted from this idea of, you know, you can own anything or really you can, you know, whatever you set your mind to in America, you can make it happen. And when Poltergeist was coming out and there was, a, frankly, actually, there was a lot of recession and inflation, a lot of stuff that we're actually seeing nowadays that was sort of at the kind of crux for the beginning of Poltergeist. A president's greatest responsibility is to protect all our people from enemies, foreign and domestic. Here at home, the worst enemy we face is economic, the creeping erosion of the American way of life and the American dream that has resulted in today's tragedy of economic stagnation and unemployment. This family was, you know, in some ways experiencing the same things that we're experiencing nowadays, but the fact that they were in suburbia and they've already sort of, they've essentially accomplished their dream. And that's sort of, I think, part of the idea that Hooper and Spielberg are both sort of playing in here is that in this capacity and almost the Reagan era ideal of the American dream, it's getting to yourself to a position where you have so much, you know, economic power or social power where you don't have to think about how it affects someone else, how it affects, say, for instance, the view of a uh, valley or what happens when you decide to not move a bunch of dead bodies from a cemetery and instead boost the bottom line of your corporation without recognizing how much that is going to hurt those around you? You know, I think I, as you're talking too, I, I'm thinking about those two characters, Nelson and Williams's characters. And the other thing that they are is baby boomers. And we know that they're baby boomers because Joe Beth Williams was in The Big Chill, so, which is yeah. like the old, ultimate baby boomer movie. So, and there is that whole question of what, is it, what, did, what did it mean for baby boomers to grow up? You know, because I, I think they were in many respects the first American generation that at least toyed with the idea of not growing up or that grew up somewhat reluctantly, that there was sort of a sense that, yeah, I'm still going to be up in my bedroom smoking pot, even when I have kids, you know, I'm going to sort of hang on to many of the qualities of my youth. I'll always be kind of young. I'll always be the way that I was in college, you know, during the protest era. And it's just the first onset of counterculture. And I'm thinking about that, too, that one of maybe one of the other fears that Toby Hooper and everybody else connected to this movie are exploring is that idea. What does it mean to grow up and to be in charge of kids and maybe like turning on the television and using that as a babysitter isn't a really great idea. Yeah, no, actually, there's a there's a scene in Poltergeist where Carol Ann is watching TV from the kitchen and she's like staring very closely and intently into the static of the of the screen. And we as audiences can be like, oh, I bet she's talking to ghosts there. But Jo Beth Williams walks over and says, oh, you're sitting too close. That's going to hurt your eyes. And she immediately switches the channel to this scene of a soldier from like a old World War II movie being shot and killed in front of them. Oh, honey, you're gonna ruin your eyes. This is not good for you. And I think that that 
kind of speaks to some of that of just like not really taking into consideration maybe everything that their parents did when they were growing up, sort of this distance that they will create. And I think in some ways the suburbs were in and of themselves a shelter too. But I think this sort of generational shift that you're speaking of, especially from the sort of counterculture youth of like really the 1960s and then how the economic depressions that were happening in the late 70s and into that sort of Reagan revolution that was going on, that's kind of part of the whole sort of impetus and theme that I see within this entire film. So yeah, like I think, you know, at face value, Poltergeist is this really like a ghostly fantasy about these loving suburban parents really fighting against evil to save their family. But at its core, I see that generational shift that you're speaking to because it's a it's a film that uses a lot of like classic tenets of ghost stories, but really to talk about how the counterculture shifted into more of this like safety of the Reagan era American dream where they can sort of shelter themselves from the outside world and everything that was sort of socially going on in the country. Yeah, I mean, look, by the time we've traversed, you know, two decades or more, to this moment. The television is a really different thing. Now it's this kind of ubiquitous appliance. It's You use it at breakfast time, you use it at lunchtime, you use it at dinner, you use it when you're going to bed. It's kind of there all the time. And I'm also thinking that maybe another thing that's happening here in this movie is a kind of silent questioning of that relationship too. What is this thing that's like now in almost every room of the house? Yeah, no, actually, that was uh, something that was originally in my book that I took out, which is just the idea of how fears over the ways that television can warp children's minds were a little unfounded, even if they did come from a place of wanting to have what's best for their kids. But technology and how it sort of weaves throughout this sort of modern suburban home is just so unique at the time because we hadn't really seen kind of the television as sort of like a technological conduit for for like a supernatural world ever before, even even though we do now see that in David Cronenberg's Videodrome. And of course, the television plays a quite a large role in the Japanese film Ring as well. Yeah. So the last thing I want to bring up, and I don't want to be glib about this. In fact, I do. I have known in my life members of the Dunn family. I knew Dominic Dunn pretty well for a while, although he eventually got mad at me. You know, there's, there's this whole idea that maybe reality imitated art. There's this notion, obviously, of, of some kind of curse within the movie. And then bad things started to happen to people who were in this movie. I know this is something you had to deal with in your book. Can you say a, a little bit about this, about the this notion of a poltergeist curse? Yeah. So I'm one that will say that there isn't a poltergeist curse. I think that there are a lot of bizarre stories that come up and center around horror movies from The Exorcist to The Omen and Rosemary's Baby, these sort of like things that could potentially come off the screen and into real life. And there are different like kind of pieces and places where this curse kind of came out of, but I personally see it as frankly, a way for the media to capitalize on a series of just unbelievable tragedies that happened. And I don't think that any of these tragedies have supernatural means at all, but they were a way for us to engage with and try and kind of wrap our heads around these things that are really almost too horrible for us to really deal with and, and characterize. And it's so much easier to think about, oh, there's there's a supernatural explanation for this young girl's sudden death or this other young girl's sudden murder or all of these other actors that were affected by what has been sort of colloquially known as the poltergeist curse. But really, I think if anything, we use that curse kind of, as I said, the suburban shield uh, to shield us from kind of the everyday lives of domestic violence and disease. And, and medical negligence when really we should have been kind of more focused on understanding that so that these sort of tragedies don't occur. But, you know, when they when they say that it's a big curse, people pick up on it and it becomes part of pop culture. 
Right. I think you explained that very beautifully and sensitively, and, and I thank you for that. So well, we've been talking to Jacob Trussell, a writer and the author of a forthcoming book about poltergeists from Die, Die Books. It really sounds fascinating. So I want to thank you for being with us today, Jacob. I want to thank everybody else for tuning in today. We'll see you a year from now with another Halloween horror show, which Mr. McPants will have to remind me is happening. But meanwhile, enjoy the fear. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>